I was invited to a trip to Haiti, which if you're not familiar with, it is located in the Caribbean. If you were to go from the US, you have Florida all the way on the East Coast. Then down below that, you have Cuba. And then just southeast of that is this island, which on the left side is Haiti. And then the right half is divided into Dominican Republic. Most people, I think, have heard of it at least because of some terrible natural disasters that they've had. And lately in the news, you might have heard about the president being assassinated. So it's recently been in people's awareness, if at all, because of some negative things. I really wanna talk about this trip that I had because of how impactful it was for me. So to set this up, um, I was working for a company Part of the business model was to take some of the profits and donate it to a nonprofit organization, which was this organization called Rice Bowls. Now, Rice Bowls, their mission is to work with orphanages. And at least in Haiti, there was at least one specific women's safe house, which is a place where young women or young girls have been able to make it to and be able to live in and be safe from the uh, domestic violence that they've faced, death threats, and just like, like these very terrible things. So it's, it's an all women safe haven. And what Rice Bowls does is they work with these specific places, gathers funds, and helps to supply these places with whatever they might need. Most of that has to do with food, but some of it has to do with supplies for learning. Uh, some of it has to do with just basic um, living necessities. And so because the company that I had worked for was a consistent donor to Rice Bowls, they had set up a trip to actually go and see the work that they do. Of course, I, I jumped on the opportunity because it was um, important for me to actually get a little bit of a glimpse into nonprofit work because that's another thing that I've never, I, I haven't had any exposure to really. And um, I know, it, at least in my general circle, that one skepticism that a lot of people seem to have about nonprofits is there's this idea that you send them your money and it just goes to bureaucracy or it doesn't actually get to the people that it says it's supposed to help. The first thing that I noticed when we landed was the sense of chaos in the airport. Now, I have been to countries where it is chaotic at the airport. There's people lined up waiting for tourists coming out of the airport to you know, get them a taxi, get them a bus, set up a tour with them. And um, it, it can be a little bit intimidating and yeah, a little bit chaotic. And Haiti was definitely that as well. So we had landed off the plane, entered the airport terminal, got our luggage. The person that was organizing this whole trip was telling us who we were actually going to be meeting up with, which local person we were going to be meeting up with, and to just go in this one particular direction until we reach that person. And don't stop for anybody else. Don't talk to anybody else. Don't hand anybody your bag and don't let anybody grab your bag your bag. And so just from those instructions right there, there was a little bit of a anxiety buildup, I guess, but um, it was for good reason. So as soon as you exit the airport, again, there's just a, a row of people that are coming up to you, asking you where you're going. People are literally trying to like grab your bag and kind of not just outright run away with it, but just kind of lead you over like as if you were supposed to go with them. I finally get towards the end of everybody and then there's this one guy that grabs my bag and says something that I didn't quite understand and granted there's this chaos there's all this loud noise there's all these people around so it was hard to understand what he was saying even though he was speaking English now when he's grabbing my bag I generally hear him say that he's I'm supposed to go with him and that uh, he knows where we're all supposed to be headed but the at this time, there's all these people around, there's all this commotion. So um, a lot of my group was behind me. And the person that was organizing this trip was helping some other people with some things. So I was kind of separated a little bit. And this guy grabs my bag and he's starting to walk away. So I'm kind of freaking out a little bit. I'm, I'm rushing back towards him, telling him like, no, I'm okay. And then fortunately the, uh, I guess you could call it not a tour guide, but our guide um, for this trip 
comes up and says, like, yes, that's the guy. We can we can go with him. So I follow this guy to this tiny little white pickup truck that he has. We throw everything into the back. There are, I think, three women that are with us, and we load them into the cab of the truck. And then there was me. There were two other people that were about my age. Then there were two other people that were a little bit older. So us guys got into the back of the pickup truck in the the bed, and we're literally just like sitting along the side of the pickup bed. They tell us to like keep your hands on your luggage and keep an eye out for anybody that will try to grab you or your things while we're driving. And so we're sitting on the back, obviously sticking out like sore thumbs compared to all the local people that were there. The truck takes off, we start going down this dirt road, and sure enough, there are people that are walking next to the truck. You know, we're kind of stuck in traffic every once in a while and asking us questions, people that are speaking Haitian Creole, which is the language that they speak there. We're going on this adventure. All the roads are super bumpy and and dusty. There's always just this feeling of like trying to be on the lookout for things and basically we're we're taking this trip over to the place that we're going to stay for the remainder of the trip now overall even though it was a little bit sketchy and you just kind of had to be on guard i was pretty excited like i knew that the person that organized this trip had been doing this for years rice bowls has been an organization for quite some time and so this isn't new to them at least two of the people that were on this trip with us they had done this time and time again not only in haiti but also in honduras in india in the philippines and um you know the place that we were headed to again it wasn't the the port where all the cruise ships land and all the the international tourists go like we were going into a part of Port-au-Prince that is very poor it's a part of the country that is not like beautiful white sand beaches it's real life but I knew that the people that we were with had this experience they put this together knowing who was going to be on this trip with us I felt pretty comfortable that we were in good hands and so overall I've it was exciting. It was an adventure. It just was an exciting opening to this whole endeavor. Now, as we're approaching the area where we're finally going to get to our hotel, I think the first thing that was really eye-opening that I could kind of calmly observe, because again, the airport was just chaos, as eye-opening as that was, the things that stuck out to me visually were, first and foremost, everything around you from the homes, the buildings, the cars, everything just seems constantly covered in a, a film of of dust and sand and so there's that grittiness to things it would be pretty common that as we're driving down a road somewhere in the distance you would see piles of trash being burned so on top of all of this dust that's flying in the air you have all this gray smoke that are going up into the sky as well and then you would look at the people just walking down the streets it was people walking in you know shoes long sleeve shirts pants even though it's like 90 degrees out and super dusty and everything the shops that lined the the side of the road you would look at those and a lot of them were pretty crudely uh, constructed i didn't really have any expectations going into haiti but um this was just a big reality check and see that i guess that we were coming into this environment um almost as like an adventure as a temporary mission that we were on but looking around and just taking in the environment and thinking how all of these people around us this is their every day this is is morning till night, from birth till death. This is the environment that they live in. It's a very harsh one. Being off of out of the airport and being off of the highway on into this town, it was just the car was going a little bit slower, and I was able to kind of just visually take in all of this and um, contemplate things more. There were times that the four of us in the back of the truck were, were talking, and then there were other times where we were just kind of observing and looking and, and, and trying to get to our destination. Now, one of the people that was on this trip with us that was sitting in the back of the truck was working with rice bowls, but they were also on the trip as, at least partially, to document the experience. So they did have a camera. And he was um, in the back of the truck. He was taking pictures as we were driving along. And I think there were there was one or two occasions when the guide that was with us had noticed that somebody on the side of the road was yelling, specifically yelling at our car because they see this this white kid in the back with a, a camera in his hands. I don't know what they were yelling. It obviously sounded a little bit 
aggressive and, and confrontational. He noticed one person that found something on the floor and uh, was looking to throw it in our direction. So fortunately, no one got hurt. That might just kind of give you a another idea of the environment. And so we kind of witnessed this hostility towards our car. And I guess it, it wasn't that surprising, I suppose, because you look around and you just see that this is obviously a very poverty-stricken place, a very rugged, hostile environment. And so it, it makes sense, you know, when you stick out that much, people are going to turn their heads and look in the best case. And in the worst case, yeah, there, there probably will be some hostility. But not only that, if you didn't know, Haiti actually is very unique in the sense that it was the first... Uh, Let me look this up real quick so I don't get it wrong because it's a very important fact about it. Okay, so this, this is from Britannica and it says, Haiti, whose population is almost entirely descended from African slaves, won independence from France in 1804, making it the second country in the Americas after the U.S. to free itself from colonial rule. Now, the big fact here is that um, the Haitian Revolution that won the country its freedom. It was the only successful slave revolt in human history. It's the only free republic born of a successful slave rebellion, also the first black republic. And so there's obviously a lot of very rich history that's worth learning more about. But in a nutshell, the country was one that was born out of a lot of turmoil. One being slavery, of course, and all of the atrocities that comes with that, but two, multiple forms of colonial rule that exploited its natural resources. Basically, when you have multiple colonizers taking over a country and fighting over it and enslaving the people, it's just, it's a recipe for really tough times, to say the very least, even once the country is free from that rule. And in this case, the you know, going through an entire revolution. And so, Needless to say, it's to this day, it's not like those, all, everything's just going to be fine and, and easy, right? It, it's coming from a lot of chaos. And I can totally see that just a uh, defensiveness against foreigners, a suspicious attitude towards foreigners, any people that, that aren't from there, um, I could see that being a total natural reaction or natural thing that occurs. Now, one thing that was really cool was that the driver that took us uh, to our hotel, as well as two, uh, I think, you know, they were probably 20 something year olds, local young adults that were there with us, uh, very friendly, very sweet, loving people. Rice Bowls has, has worked with them for pretty much every time that they go there. And the the driver is a pastor at a church, as well as, I guess you would consider it like the organizer or principal of a school, which I'll get to a little bit later, because that's a big part of the experience. But so there was him, he was an amazing person. And then there were the two younger adults that were there. And they were um, our translators, as well as um, kind of helping us with some logistics. So uh, we met them, and uh, we were just kind of planning for the next days and where we were going to go. We had a dinner at the hotel, which it wasn't like a, a big fancy hotel. It was it was really comfortable and everything, but uh, it was it was a small place in the outskirts of Port-au-Prince. And so we that was our first day. That was our first day there and our first night there. So next, I want to talk about the real meat of the trip, which was visiting the orphanages and the women's safe house. So as you can imagine, in all of this poverty that surrounds this area, there are many children that have very rough lives and unstable families. And so Rice Bowls was working with one of these local orphanages that took in kids that lost their parents either through violence or were given up by their parents. And the two young adults that I had mentioned earlier that were translating for us and kind of helping us organize everything between the orphanage getting the food, bringing in the food to the orphanages, and just like getting from point A to point B and the logistical stuff. 
they actually were part of the orphanage as children. And now they've grown into these young adults that are bilingual and are helping this organization serve their local community. It was really special to meet them and go with them to these places, knowing that they actually came from the, not only the orphanage, but they came from the benefits that were received from the donations from Rice Bowls. And so the the guy that was organizing this trip for us that works with Rice Bowls, like he had known these two young adults since they were kids. And when we got to the orphanage, a lot of the children there recognized him and you could tell like it, this wasn't he's he's been here many times before and i guess it just i say that because it left this firm impression that like i mentioned earlier a lot of people have this skepticism that nonprofits the money doesn't actually go to the people that it says that it, it serves but here was an example of the local people referring to him by his first name and he's talking to them in a way where there's already a rapport and he's seen them grow up over time and so it was it was really cool to be on this trip with an organization like that because it really did seem like the people that were there were benefiting from the donation that were being made. So we went to these orphanages. A lot of the the kids were just very excited to see visitors, especially the younger ones. They wanted to play games. Most of them didn't speak English, so communication was mostly nonverbal. But they all wanted to play games. They wanted to show us things that uh, like toys that they had or things that they were working on. Um, there was a basketball hoop in the back of this little orphanage house. And so a lot of them wanted to start playing basketball. A lot of them were like playing with our hair. I guess that our hair was uh, something they were fascinated by. I've never been in, in an, a situation or an environment like that or, or had an experience like that. And it was wild. I guess I still don't know exactly the best way to describe it other than, yeah, it was just, it was... It was wild and interesting and uh, heartwarming in the sense that because they're children and they had a genuine fascination with these new people that came into their environment, there was just a sense of, you know, real humanity and genuine spirit while we were there. There weren't really any expectations from anybody that was there other than um, just taking in something new and being open and sharing. So we we had lunch at this orphanage, uh, set up this table with all of this food, and then the kids got to get a plate and a line up and grab food, and we all ate together on the patio. But yeah, it was, it was a great meal. And I need to point out that this is a town in this country where from what I heard and what I learned, having three meals a day like we do here in the US is, is not a thing. Like it, we take that for granted here. Like it's three meals a day for us, I feel like is we're unsatisfied with that. You know, not only do we, we need breakfast, lunch, and dinner, but we're constantly snacking throughout the day. And, you know, how many times have you gone out with friends to have dinner and then you're grabbing all these drinks as well? And then after you leave that place that you're eating at, the next thing is like, hey, let's go get dessert. And you're going off to some place to get boba or ice cream or something. And it's just such a luxury because out there, except for in this case, you know, like these places, like these orphanages where they actually are being supplied regular, consistent, nourishing meals, many people in that area eating once a day is common. As the driver, who again, I mentioned, he he also is the organizer or principal of a school, I guess maybe like an elementary school there. He said a lot of times kids in that town, they, they'll go to school without food. And we were walking or we were driving through the town and we saw women carrying these containers on their heads that were going to a local well. Like drinking water wasn't something that just comes out of your faucet or your refrigerator. It's like you had to go get drinking water. And that drinking water may or may not be completely safe to drink. And so that was the environment that we were in. It was really special to be able to share a meal with everybody there and to see the kids just taking spoonfuls of of everything on their plate and, and just enjoying it. Because yeah, it's not something that comes easy for people in that part of the world. Now, the next day after the orphanage, we went to, again, like I mentioned, a woman's women's safe house. And so 
Uh, this is a, a place that's run by this one woman is kind of the, the the head of the whole place. And she takes in young girls that have been abused, sex trafficked, lost their parents and have been orphaned or just generally escaping violence. And I mean, it was it was very real. Like there was there was one girl that still had on her face like the the um, I don't not scars, but like remnants, I guess, of being hit. And she was new to the place. She had only recently been taken in and starting to adapt to this this new family. Basically, we had also seen photos of, of what she had looked like before. Or, or recently and so it was very raw and it was very real and this was just a home that was led by this matriarch and a range of of girls from six or seven all the way up into their teens and just trying to stick together and support each other and survive and just grow up in a safe place and so just like with the orphanage there was just a lot of curious kids playful kids everybody had something that they wanted to share or show we started eating we started having lunch together and you would see some some of the girls uh, out in the yard and they would be singing or they would be dancing together yeah it was it was really cool just to again experience this like humanity of people that are just trying to make the best out of what they have. We were playing games. Somebody had organized this one game for all of us to play, like one of the typical schoolyard games that you might play in elementary school. And it was just, I guess, it was just about spending an afternoon with the people there. That was it. There, again, there weren't really any expectations. It was just about being present. And so that was the the second place that we visited. Now, I mentioned before that there was this driver works as a principal of a school. Uh, he's also a pastor of a local church. And uh, so he's a very busy person, a very respected person in his community. And uh, the last place that we went to was, uh, well, the last places that we went to was to visit those that school and to visit that church. The reason why that was eye-opening was because when you think of a school, when I think of a school, I think of a school here, the school that I went to. It has a blacktop asphalt yard with basketball hoops and then all the classrooms and all the teachers and there's like elementary school from first grade to like fifth grade. Then you go to high school and you know eventually college and all that. But here, at, at least in this part of this, this town, the school was literally just cinder blocks that was put together by the local people in the town. The floors were all dirt. The table Tables and chairs were just pretty raw looking wood tables and, ta and chairs. The kids all wore uniforms with, you know, high socks and um, yeah, these kind of like heavy fabrics, even though it was like 90 degrees out. The, the teachers did the same. They would wear long pants and dress shoes and long sleeve button up shirts, even though it not only was it hot, but you've got all this dust in the air and everything. The building, I, I don't know square footage wise, but it was not a big structure. You know, the classrooms would separate kids of different age groups, but those separations, like the separation between each classroom was an unfinished wall. Like the wall didn't completely enclose a single room that had its own door. It was like, there was kind of a partition wall and you could just simply walk past that and you'd be in another classroom. We went there and we got in front of the class and just said hello and introduced ourselves and what our name was. And I think we said something like what, uh, what games we like to play something like that. One of those kids that grew up in the orphanage that I mentioned, that's now an adult, he was translating for us. And again, we shared lunch because Rice Bowls supplies that school with food. And then we went out for a break, or I guess like in the US we might call recess. So the kids are, are not sitting in class anymore, they get to go out and play. Instead of like a blacktop or a nice grassy field, it's just a plot of dirt outside of the, the building. And so the kids are playing soccer, they're playing jump rope, they're playing chase. We joined in on a lot of those games and it was really fun. But yeah, it was just a super hot, sunny day. Again, like 90 degrees out, super dusty, dirt flying everywhere. They had mentioned to us that they had just recently installed a new water, uh, I think it's like a water filtration system, because in that area, it is possible to get contaminated water. The organization had helped to pay for a water filtration system specifically for the school, so that when kids go to this school, um, 
they can have clean water. Another thing that they mentioned was that the school and the teachers that teach the classes and the man that runs the school, they don't get paid like you would think teachers get paid here, right? Like you get paid a salary, you get a paycheck. Pay over there is like if the community can pitch in a little bit of money every once in a while, then the teachers can have some money, but they're not really making any kind of profit there. In fact, most of the people in this town, from what I had learned, the economy is not like you make money and then you can save it and buy up nice things buy your food, buy your staples, and then go buy more clothes and luxury items and, ex and nights out on the town or experiences. Like you barely make enough to eat and survive and you grow what you can you barter what you can for what you need you sell whatever you can on, on the side of the street it's almost like the the teachers were teaching for free almost it's just such a different experience that really makes you think about like how easy we have it here comparatively you know, we we have a lot of problems here in the U.S. and and people suffering here obviously is not to be taken for granted. But at the same time that that is true, I, I've also heard the saying that um, you know the poorest people here are rich compared to the poor in other places. And I think there is some truth to that because this, again, this is a place where kids going to school in many cases might not have clean water, in many cases might not have a lunch to bring, and are sitting in dirt classrooms in 90 to 100 degree weather. There's no AC. I don't know if they even had textbooks. The teachers aren't really being paid. Ah, it it's just, uh, it's unfortunate and it's sad and it's, it was a unique and challenging experience to just sit there knowing that at the end of this, I think it was like a week trip, we would all be flying back home and we would be flying back to air conditioning and traffic lights and paved roads and a education system that gets you through to college and jobs and we could all do that, you know. We even, even while we were there, we knew we at the end of the day, we we're going to go back to a hotel where we had our cell phones and where we had, um, the rest of the money that we had brought for the trip and some fresh, clean clothes and bottled water and refrigerators. And yeah, it just, uh, it was such a wild experience because of, um, I don't even know if this is the right word, but just the humanity, like to, to be in the presence of that um, and realize how good, how good we have it. And so I could ramble on more and more, but in a nutshell, that was the essence of the trip. It was very eye-opening. It was very impactful. I have actually still been in touch with uh, some of the people from that trip, not just the Americans that went with us, but also the Haitians, the pastor slash uh, principal slash driver on this trip. I have been in touch with him through Facebook, Facebook Messenger. People do have access to cell phones there. I think it was about a year ago, maybe less than that, I had helped to organize a Facebook fundraiser for him because he had mentioned that he wanted to um, purchase some laptops, some very cheap, non-high-tech laptops for the students just to be able to teach the children like how to use basic, like I think word processors, basic functions of how, how computers work, like things that we would take for granted. You know, I had asked friends and family and people in my Facebook community to donate. And I, I mentioned the trip that I had taken to Haiti and that I had seen the money actually go to the community. So so people pitched in and we, we purchased some laptops. That was important to me because not only was it important because he simply asked, it's just crazy how like even here in Southern California, you know, if you don't keep up with technology, at some point you get left behind. I learned how to play Oregon Trail on a computer when I was in third grade, I think. And <laughs> that was just a game. And then throughout the rest of elementary school and middle school and high school, like the internet started coming about. I was on AIM chatting with my friends, starting to use the dial-up internet. And here, like unless somebody can help these communities just simply get their hands on some basic like not powerful computers. Unless they can get that assistance, it just seems scary that they could be so far behind in terms of being used to uh, technology and being able to utilize it. So we helped raise money for that. I think 
there was one other fundraiser that we did that also helped raise money for the water filtration uh, system. Or was it solar panels? And so anyways, the last thing that I'll say is that I had, um, I think right before the pandemic or right at the start of it, I had really started listening to a lot of content from Dave Ramsey. He's a financial person on YouTube and podcasts and stuff. And he talks about uh, budgeting and saving and investing, real estate, all that type of thing, all those things. And one of the things that he talks about a lot is to consistently budget for not only the things that you need, and then also the things that uphold your standard of living, like the activities that you do, the entertainment that you have. You budget for all of that stuff, but make sure to also budget for, I think it's like 10% of your monthly income for giving to whatever you want to give to, but like specifically for selfless giving. And so I really took that to heart. I thought that was it sounded like a good way to manage money and also stay humble. So I've been donating my money either to rice bowls every month, just just 10% of what I make every month, either directly to rice bowls or to a few of the people that I'm still in contact with in Haiti, I'm sending them money directly. And yeah, I just, I think it's, it's a good idea. So if you're interested in doing the same thing, Rice Bowls is a licensed nonprofit, so you can always donate to them and learn more about them through their website. I'll post a link to it down in the description. And like I mentioned, when you do donate to Rice Bowls, it's an organization that, from what I've seen firsthand, is on the ground with the people that they serve, bringing them supplies, handing it to the people that need those supplies. And so that money is put to good use. The impact is real and it's uh, meaningful to the kids, the locals that are in those communities. So definitely consider doing that.